Hello, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may be. My name is David Shucker. I'm with Schmerzel USA, and I'm hosting today's webinar. Today we have programmable safety controllers with uh, Nicholas Styler. So if you were expecting other content, then you are in the wrong webinar. Before I introduce Nick, uh, let me just go over some housekeeping things. Uh, we are recording this session, so if you do want to watch it again or you want to pass it on to colleagues, we will be emailing it to you probably tomorrow morning. In the uh, GoToMeeting area, you have a couple of uh, items you might want to be made aware of. Uh, in the Handouts tab, we have some brochures and some other things you can download uh, just for your reference. There should also be a video tab with some links to some content we have on YouTube, which is uh, some basic animation videos about today's product. And there is a questions tab. So if you have any questions about uh, today's content, uh, feel free to just type it in there. And uh, don't be shy. We won't uh, judge any of your questions. Uh, and Put them in as the presentation is going on. I will, from time to time, break in on Nick and uh, interrupt if there's some uh, pretty good questions to answer. And uh, we do have some time at the end to answer any other questions. And if we don't get to your questions, we will follow up uh, either today or tomorrow. At the very end, after the presentation, we do have a survey. If you would mind just answering a few quick questions about your participation here. And with nothing further to do, I have the pleasure of introducing you to Nicholas Style. Styler. There we go. He is a regional salesman for Schmerzel. He's been with us for about five years now. He is a certified electrical safety engineer by TUV, and he just uh, passed another TUV course for functional safety, I believe. Um, Nick is going to present to you programmable safety controllers. So Nick, take it away. Thank you very much, David. And thank you everyone for attending today's webinar. Um, for today's presentation, I plan to do a quick overview of the hardware and field bus features on the PSC-1 safety controller. Then I'm gonna highlight the serial diagnostics 4.0 safety bus and safe drive monitoring functions which are integrated into the PSC-1 safety controller. Uh, while there are many aspects of this controller that make it a standout product on the market today, these two features really make the PSC-1 uh, a market leader for not only today's equipment, but for next generation equipment, and are really the cornerstones for increasing production and reducing cost through the utilization of the Schmerzel PSC-1 safety controller. Uh, so I plan a, a good portion of the presentation on those two um, uh, bullet points there. Then I'm going to review some of the user-friendly software and diagnostics features of the safety controller, which make it a, you know, such a pleasure to work with. And then we'll wrap up the presentation with a overview of how the increased production and reduced costs can be realized with this technology, uh, followed by a quick review of some additional resources that are available to you. And then we'll get into the uh, Q&A portion of today's webinar. Uh, so with that, I'm going to jump into uh, the first slide here, which is a, a hardware overview. Um, on the PSC-1 uh, safety controller, there's a, a few different options and, and hardware features that I like to highlight. Uh, the first is the SDHC memory card slot. This is an uh, external memory that uh, you can use for loading uh, new programs or um, retrieving programs from a safety controller in the field. Uh, there is internal memory, so it is not required to use a memory card to use this product. There's also a alphanumerical numerical display for status and error code enunciation uh, for the PSC-1 C10. So by opening a control panel and physically looking at the controller, uh, you'll be able to see if you've got a fault or alarm code and if you uh, are in a run mode. Next, we have the programming connection port and then the individual LED indicators for every input, output, and field bus uh, on the system uh, for individual status enunciation. So again, 
if you open up a control cabinet and look at your hardware, you can see where you've got your connections and possibly where you have some faults uh, in the system. The safety controller does offer safe semi semiconductor outputs, safe relay outputs, as well as safety inputs. Then we've got the serial diagnostics bus inputs, uh, which are up here, and I'll highlight those uh, further later on in the presentation. We have your RJ45 ports for our internal field bus utilized for safe device-to-device -device communication, as well as our safe master-to-master -master communication between our devices. So if you're integrating a production line or multiple um, control panels together, you can utilize uh, multiple PSC1s. We've got encoder inputs, which are gonna be utilized for the safe drive monitoring and uh, safe motion uh, integration into the controller. And then we've got finally our ethernet-based field bus or safety field bus, which is how you're going to communicate back to your process PLC or the HMI on the system. So with the PSC1, uh, we've got two basic families, the PSC1 C10 and the PSC1 C100. Both families include Ethernet IP, Profinet, and EtherCAT field bus, uh, which is selectable via the software. Both families support uh, safe field bus protocols as well, so your Profi safe over Profinet and your safety over EtherCAT communication. Uh, both families support the integrated serial diagnostics 4.0 safety bus. Both families can do safe master-to-master -master communication between uh, uh, PSC1s. Both families have the option of an SDHC memory card slot uh, for storing and retrieving application programs. They offer a reaction time of eight milliseconds uh, from input to output, as well as a fast shutoff channel for a two millisecond response time. They have safe two amp semiconductor outputs, as well as safe drive monitoring functions to IEC 61800-5-2. Uh, in addition, the PSC1 is going to give you an, another 20 adjustable safety inputs or safety rated outputs. Uh, it allows you to do safe device to device communication, so remote I.O. Uh, it can do an additional safe drive monitoring expansion for up to 12 axis of motion, and it increases the memory for up to 3,000 instructions. On the base unit, the PSC1 C10, you're gonna have a standard 14 safety inputs, four safe semiconductor outputs at two amps, which is a pretty high amperage for a safety controller. You've got your two safe relay outputs, again at two amps. You get two signaling outputs, so if you wanna run an indicator light or a hardwired output to a PLC to indicate something has happened, uh, you can hardwire those outputs for that purpose. The PSC1 C10 is modularly expandable with up to two centralized I.O. modules, or again, with the safe master master communication, you can do four um, different CPUs. You can monitor up to two axes of motion with the PSC1 C10, and then you've got a memory for 800 instructions. Uh, when we say memory for 800 instructions, that's a pretty high number, even though it's our smaller of the two uh, product offerings. The next closest competitor on the market today is about 300 instructions. So there is really a lot of programming capability and power uh, built into, into this system. As I mentioned in the previous slide, when we jump up to the PSC1 C100, you still have the base 14 safety inputs, uh, but now you have an additional 20 adjustable safe IO. So those can be used as uh, safety inputs or safety outputs uh, in, your, in your system. If you have a machine that requires a lot of different safety outputs, this might be one avenue to consider. Uh, again, we have the safe semiconductor, safe relay and signaling outputs, the same as the PSC1 C10, but now we can modularly expand up to eight IO modules, either central or decentral, and we can do um, remote IO via the ethernet safe de de uh, device to device communication, which is your decentral uh, IO. Uh, we can now monitor up to 12 axes of motion with this controller and up to 3,000 instructions, so 10 times uh, the memory capability and programming capability of the next closest competitor on the market. When we look at our input and output expansion options, there's central applications where you're going to be located in the same control cabinet and the IOs communicated back to the base PLC over a backplane bus. 
there's two options here. The first option, you're going to have 12 safety inputs and 10 selectable safe I.O. with two signaling outputs. And then the second option, we're basically taking four of those selectable I.O. and converting them to relay outputs if you need additional relay outputs in the system. When we jump over to a decentralized application or remote I.O., uh, we're doing the communication via Ethernet, so safe device to device communication. This, this uh, controller can be located in another control cabinet or another machine and exchange data back to the base PLC. It has 14 safety inputs, four safety outputs, two safe relay outputs, and two signaling outputs. So uh, the same I.O. count that you would see on the PSC1 C10 base controller. The next option for uh, expansion is your safe master to master communication uh, this is when we're going to have the safe cross communication um, that's utilized as a composite of safety controllers to safely exchange data via local ethernet or safe master to master communication to between the devices you can expand and mix and match up to four of the safety controllers in a system like this freely and you can simultaneously um, do safe master-to-master -master communication, safe device-to-device -device communication with remote I.O. Each of the base controllers can have a serial diagnostics 4.0 safety bus with up to 31 devices. Uh, you also get the field bus communication from each device. So if one of the machines in your production line is on Ethernet IP, but another is on Profinet, that's not a problem. The local safety controller that is separated out like this uh, can communicate back to whichever process PLC communication is in that machine, but the safety communication can still be communicated between machines over the safe to device to uh, safe master to master communication. So it really gives you a optimized solution for expansion with large machine lines or or multiple pieces of equipment that are connected together. The next hardware feature that uh, we want to mention is the safe drive monitoring. In the PSC1 C10, this is an integrated solution. So the encoder inputs would be on the base controller for either one or two accesses uh, with, with a one encoder system. The safe drive monitoring with the PSC1 C100 utilizes expansion modules and can safely monitor up to 12 accesses of motion uh, with up to six expansion modules. Next, I wanted to talk a little bit further about the memory card slot and uh, how that is utilized. Uh, basically, we can use a 2, 4, 8, or 16 gigabyte SD card. Uh, you can put the card into your laptop or your computer and format it to FAT16 or FAT32. So um, you can, if you have a memory card lying around or you get one um, you know, from Amazon or something, you can feel free to use that memory card for your system. Uh, you'll have to copy the configuration file from your application program to the card and rename it. And then your application program must be stored in the root directory of the card. Uh, only one program can be stored on the card. You can plug the card into the memory card slot, either under power or when the, when the controller is not powered on. You power the controller off and then back on. And after boot up, the system is going to hang in a stop status. So the seven segment display, uh, the status display on the alphanumerical display will show a five instead of a four. You'll press the function button twice within three seconds, and the program will be transferred from your memory card to the internal uh, memory of the safety controller. And then your program will start and you'll, you'll go to that four status or run status. If we include the assembly language files, the network settings are also transferred in this manner. So there's no need to connect the laptop to load the logic program uh, and network um, program for subsequent machines. So if you program an Ethernet IP machine and you want to uh, load those program, uh, that, that network settings as well as your logic settings, you can do that with the, with the memory card slot. Okay, Nick, uh, before you move on, because I know you're going to start talking about communication options and that kind of stuff, uh, I do have a question from okay. our uh, attendees. Um, what makes these controllers different from a PLC? So the difference between these and a PLC is these are dedicated controllers for safety. 
So it's a way to separate your safety system out from the PLC, lower the cost of your PLC, and more securely uh, guard your actual safety logic. Uh, the next thing is that if you're building a machine with, say, a Ethernet IP-based PLC, when you separate your safety out and standardize on a safe, separate safety uh, system, that same safety system can be activated for Ethernet IP, EtherCAT, or Profinet. So if your machine is um, being sold to different customers who might uh, specify Ethernet IP, Profinet, or EtherCAT, uh, you would be able to just switch the communication protocol without changing your hardware. Uh, so it optimizes your separate safety solution for the global market as well as uh, any, any local um, machines that you may have in your facility. Uh, the next thing that makes this a little different than a, a PLC with integrated safety, uh, the response time of a system like this from input to output from the logic standpoint is going to be much faster. Uh, fast shutoff time of two milliseconds and standard response time of eight milliseconds is, is very fast for a safety system. Typically speaking, when you have safety integrated to a process PLC, uh, the safety I.O. modules are closer to a 30 millisecond response time from input to output and typically don't offer the fast shutoff time. Uh, and then the, the another feature is going to be that higher amperage on your output power, uh, which I'll touch on a little bit further later, but that also uh, can eliminate some additional components in your control panel, such as interposing relays that may be needed to bump up power uh, in a system. So all in all, what you're, what you're going to be looking at here is a more secure safety system um, by separating your safety out from your process control. Uh, and it's a more secure system because, you know, integrating the PLC system, um, you know, you've got your safety separated, so no one's going to be able to mess with that. Your CRC data is going to be recorded, so if any changes are made, um, you'd, you'd have those changes uh, uh, reviewed and everything like that you'd have you'd have information showing that it was changed great uh okay. one more question before you move on uh yep. can you explain the difference between the different outputs you mentioned relays signaling uh, yeah so there's three different outputs the safe semiconductor output is uh you know it's a semiconductor output so it's not a relay output um, this is more like you'd see uh, like a PMP type of output or NPN type of output. Um, the relay output is internal relays that are going to be switching. So um, depending on what you're, you're running the outputs for, uh, certain applications you may want to use the relay outputs um, to switch and others you may just want to use a semiconductor output. Um, the other outputs are just non-safety, those two non-safety outputs. Typically, we're using those for indicator lamps, muting lamps, or a hardwired indication to a PLC to say that a certain function or reset might be required if you want to uh, communicate that back and you're not utilizing a field bus output uh, without just eating up one of your de designated safety outputs. Okay, okay. great. Uh, so let's, uh, let's move on. So moving on real quick to the field bus communication options. Um, in your base controller, when you've got the RJ45 ports, it's a dash FB1 at the end of the part number. You've got three field buses that are in that piece of hardware, your Ethernet IP, your EtherCAT, and your Profinet. So without changing any of your logic, uh, you can go into the system, you can activate Ethernet IP for one customer, you can uh, activate EtherCAT for the next or Profinet for, for another. Uh, we do have options for safety over EtherCAT and Profinet ProfiSafe, as well as some of the older um, uh, communication utilizing the RS-232 port version of the hardware. Uh, this will give you the CAN open and the ProfiBus communication, uh, and then you have the option for ProfiBus ProfiSafe. Uh, we also do have a version of the safety controller now with Modbus, so if you're using a, a Modbus system, you're trying to upgrade the safety on it, uh, integrate uh, safe motion into the machine for uh, increased productivity, this is uh, an option uh, for you from the safety system as well. And these are the additions to the part number for the safety field buses highlighted in yellow here. So for an Ethernet IP example with the field bus, um, 
there's 192 bytes of data from the PSC1 to the originator or, or process PLC and 68 bit, bit bytes of data from the process PLC back into the PSC1. The way these data bytes work, bytes zero to seven are information on the PSC1 status and programmed data bits. So if you've got an alarm output, a, a warning output, something like that, if you wanna see if the PLC is in run mode, uh, this would be where, where those, that information is communicated. Bytes eight through 15 are information on the programmed process bits. So um, these are really gonna be reserved for process data related to speed monitoring functions. Uh, at this time, bytes 16 through 127 are reserved uh, for future expansion of the product. And then bytes 128 through 191 are reserved for response information from the serial diagnostics 4.0 gateway and the 31 slates that can be connected to that. And I'm gonna highlight that communication here a little bit further as well, because that is one of the, uh, the main um, benefits of a Schmerzel system solution utilizing a PSC-1 and the serial diagnostics is the amount of information you get uh, communicated back to your process PLC to optimize uptime of equipment. Uh, from the PLC, process PLC into the PSC-1, uh, there are some bytes that are for information to the PSC-1 program, as well as bytes 4 through 67, which are re reserved for request information to the SD gateway uh, for up to the 31 slaves. So expanding on that a little bit, uh, bytes 1 through 5, again, are just maintaining the status from the functional output bits that are programmed to the PSC-1. But we jump down here to bytes 8 to 15 that are reserved for the process data for the speed monitoring functions. There are process data blocks that can report the speed of the device back through the Ethernet port to the process PLC. You can see the encoder position. It can be set as 1620 or 24-bit resolution. You can see encoder speed. It can be set as an 8, 12, or 16-bit resolution. And then when we get down to the serial diagnostics 4.0 bus, I just kind of want to give an example of some of that. Uh, if we have the first set sensor on uh, SD bus gateway as our AZM201 series uh, door interlock. And the second position on that, uh, that chain could be our BDF200 control panel. On the, on the door interlock for byte 30, 130 bit zero, that's gonna be your lock unlock command for that guard door. Byte one is gonna give you an indication that the actuator is detected. So the door is closed, it's ready to be locked. Byte two is gonna tell you the actuator is detected, the door is locked, so you've locked the door successfully and your system can restart or, or run. Uh, byte five is gonna tell you the guard door is closed, but I, I haven't seen the um, byte one turn on yet, or sorry, bit one turn on yet, so the door is closed, but the handle hasn't been actuated yet. Uh, byte six could be a communication error between the device and the safety controller, so there may be something wrong in the wiring. And then when you look at your BDF200 control panel, which might sit right next to this on, on a system, the bit three, four, and five are gonna be the push button LEDs. So you don't have to wire these into your process PLC. You're saving terminal blocks. You're saving process PLC IO by putting these on your uh, SD bus gateway. Your e-stop is going to be uh, in series with the rest of the serial diagnostics chain, but you'll get a data bit to tell you over the ethernet if that e-stop has been pushed uh, or, or needs to be reset. And then you'll get data bits for the normally open and normally closed contact blocks for your three position buttons uh, if you're choosing to use those as push buttons instead of indicator lights. Those can be push buttons, those can be indicator lights, those can be illuminated push buttons, uh, whatever you might, however you might wanna configure that control panel for uh, for your system. So there's really a, a lot of information that gets communicated back when you when you uh, utilize the serial diagnostics communication in conjunction with the controller and the field bus in a system solution. So kind of expanding on that, um, this really is an industry best status and diagnostics data today. Every connected safety sensor, solenoid interlock, and control panel is gonna communicate that the status signals, warning messages, and failure messages to the linked PLC. Uh, so there's a lot more information than what we just highlighted in that last slide, but I wanted to give a little bit of an example of, of, of that. Um, you'll, you'll get that same information, guard closed or open, solenoid locked or not locked. You also get a crosswire short indication. If you, if you shorted a wire, you'll get a data bit to tell you that. You'll get a data bit to tell you if a sensor is getting uh, too hot. Um, you'll get an, a, a, 
a data bit that'll tell you that your actuator is in a limited area or, or uh, it's starting to fall out of alignment. So that's a preventative maintenance data bit that says, hey, you know, guard door five, uh, it's falling out of alignment. The system's still going to work. It's still going to run. But at the next scheduled downtime, uh, please have maintenance look at that door because it's starting to sag, for example. Um, all of this would be wired up to performance level E, which is the highest uh, safety rating, uh, despite the series wiring. Uh, Troubleshooting is really simplified because of the amount of diagnostics information that can be displayed on an HMI or communicated uh, through the PLC. Uh, it's a great way to avoid unscheduled or reduce unscheduled downtime of equipment. I'm going to show in the next couple of slides how it's a smooth and fail-safe uh, installation. A lot of it uses M12 connections, so uh, there's less labor, intense wiring, and less terminations that an installer has to make. The solenoid interlock control is configured via the safety bus, so there's less safety outputs that need to be wired for locking or unlocking devices. That's all done over the safety bus, so you save on output uh, in, uh, output um, signals from the safety controller, uh, further reducing your panel component and cost by eliminating safety uh, I.O. and terminal blocks uh, in the panel. And then you can multi, you can run multiple SD 4.0 groups back to a single connected PSC1. So if you have a machine with two different safety zones, you can run two chains of serial diagnostics back, one for each zone, and you can input all of that data into a single PSC1 safety controller uh, and, and um, manipulate those zones independently with different outputs and, and resets and things of that nature. There's three basic ways to wire this uh, serial diagnostics 4.0 safety bus system back uh, to a safety controller. Uh, there's the M12 Y adapters, the M12 fused passive field block, block or box, which is IP67. And then if you have junction boxes, you can use hard wiring and landing of wires in a cabinet with a passive distribution module. The safety sensors and interlocks with the serial diagnostics outputs have a, a serial input and output pin instead of the conventional PNP diagnostics output. So when these SD components are daisy chained, the safety channels as well as the serial IO diagnostics channels are wired in series uh, through these blocks, which greatly reduces the number of wires coming back uh, to the panel, the number of terminal blocks that need to be used, the number of through panel um, connectors that need to be used, the number of I.O. that needs to be purchased and installed in, in the cabinet. Uh, as I mentioned before, every connected safety sensor, solenoid interlock, and control panel uh, communicates the status signals, warning messages, and failing messages to the linked process PLC. The connection of safety sensors solenoid interlocks and control panels can be grouped into different groups in the PSC1 logic, giving you the ability to zone your safety solution uh, for independently zoned outputs, locking of solenoids, and zones to be reset. So with the passive field block, uh, it's an IP67 version for installation in the field or on the machine. Uh, you can daisy chain the field boxes. Uh, they can be connected in series for more comprehensive safety functions or larger machines. You can mix and match non-locking switches, locking switches, control panels uh, in that system. Um, each of the devices can be configured easily with the dip switches on the controller based on the sensors and control panels that are connected. And these devices will have uh, internal fusing for protection. You'll also have the LED indication for diagnostics uh, on the machine if you want to walk up and look at the block. You'll see the fuse status with the green LED. You'll see the release of the connected devices from a safety standpoint by looking at the LED that is yellow. Uh, so you've got some indication not only in the, in the control panel with the safety controller, you also have it here on these blocks displayed uh, on the HMI or through the PLC, as well as on the, on the safety sensors themselves. With the passive distribution module, again, this is using junction boxes, so it's an in-cabinet solution. Uh, you get away from the M12 cables, so you're landing more wires here. It's a little bit more uh, labor intensive on the installation, uh, but you're pulling your own wire between the junction boxes back to the main cabinet. You're still reducing the number of terminal blocks and I.O. Uh, uh, needed in the cabinet, and you still get all of the diagnostics information um, that you would get with any other serial diagnostics uh, solution. 
you still get the LED indications and you still have the dip switch programming based on the components that you are connecting. So again, if, you, if you're using junction boxes, this is a, a little bit lower cost from a hardware standpoint versus the, the other two solutions, uh, but you're gonna eat that cost back up with your installation labor costs um, with landing the wires and the junction boxes and everything like that. And then finally, we've got the Y splitters or the serial diagnostics junction boxes. It's a direct, simple wiring between the safety switch gear. It's in the cable tray, so it's a very clean installation. You're still able to mix and match locking, non-locking, and control panels with this solution, uh, and you're still reducing the number of cables and, um, and, and wiring back in the cabinet. So it's another clean solution, utilizing M12 connections, reducing the actual landings of wires that need, need to be done. When you're looking at this serial diagnostics 4.0 safety bus solution, there is a system engineering tool online. Uh, you can find this on our online catalog, or we can uh, send you a link to it or assist you uh, with your design. Uh, what this will allow you to do is drop in the components that you want to use on your equipment. You can select the wire links that you're going to be using, either from the last Y splitter to the control panel, or from each Y splitter uh, to the next, or from the Y splitter to the safety sensor or interlock. It'll help you create a build of materials, uh, including the cables and devices that you've selected, but it'll also do your voltage calculations automatically for you. If you've used a lot of longer cables, you used a lot of uh, interlocks, maybe they're magnetic uh, MZM 100s that utilize more power for the lock, holding the magnet, magnetic lock shut. Uh, this will give you an indication if your configuration um, needs more voltage from the power supply or you need to uh, add power into the system uh, along the line somewhere to bump that power up and, and continue uh, uh, your design. So it's a very helpful tool and uh, it's something that uh, we can go through with you when selecting the, the correct build of materials for your project. So finally, before I, I move on, I do want to just kind of highlight an example. Uh, in the example you see here, I've got two different safety zones on serial diagnostics uh, using the passive field blocks. Uh, I've got, um, in this scenario, I've got 18 switches wired back to the device. So there's plenty of room for expansion here on, on the safety device. I'm only using four out of my 14 safety rated inputs on my controller. So I still have an additional 10 inputs if I wanted to hardwire back any other safety devices or components uh, individually to the cabinet. Uh, I can utilize this safety separate system with either a Profinet, Ethernet IP, or EtherCAT PLC uh, through this little green cable so we're showing that field bus back to the process PLC. So you've got a, a separate safety solution that's standardized for your machine and can work with any of those three process PLC field bus communication uh, data bits. Um, you can also add your, your you know, BDF 200 control panels to this and uh, um, you can expand this out further or with, with more zones if you needed to uh, in, in the system. And each of these wires coming from the cabinet, one is your serial diagnostics bus and your safety information, and the other one is going to be your power. Uh, so with this scenario, you actually have four M12 uh, cables coming back to the panel, uh, two cables for each zone. So I hope that covers the serial diagnostics and gives you a, a sort of a, a, a tasting for what we can do with our, our sensor integration uh, via the serial diagnostics bus and the PSC-1 controller. It is a huge feature with our controller for a system solution. Uh, there's a lot of cost reduction and diagnostics information there, uh, but it also is a very clean installation. The next feature that I, I kind of hinted at earlier that makes the PSC-1 a market leading product today is gonna be our safe drive monitoring functionality that we've integrated. With the safe drive monitoring, um, there's many features that are supported via the PSC-1. You've got your safe stop functions, your safe torque off, your safe stop one, your safe stop two, but you've also got a lot of safe motion functions, soft operating, safe operating stop, safe limited speed, safe speed range, safe limited position, safe limited increment, 
safe emergency limit, safe direction, and safe cam. And I'm gonna go through all of these in detail over the next couple of slides. Uh, but the real thing to, to note here is that in recent years, there's been two major developments regarding machine safety and motion control. First, there's been an increase of electronically driven motion control functionality. And then second is the uh, IEC 61800-5-2 standard, which has provided a systematic method to identify the safety function of a motion control system and assist in the design and verification of that safety function to ensure that it meets the required performance level of your uh, risk assessment. And, and the combination of those two um, developments is really um, done with the PSC-1 safety controller uh, better than any safety, safety separate solution on the market today. So the first thing I wanna talk about just briefly is the safe stop functions. A lot of these you guys have heard before, you're familiar with, whoops. Uh, safe torque off, that is when the power to the motor is safely removed so that no further movement is possible. This is a category zero stop or uncontrolled stop in accordance with IEC 60204-1. If any external force is possible, then additional measures should be provided to safely prevent uh, movement. Uh, safe stop one, this is when where the PSC-1 can monitor the motor braking or the controlled stop according to EN 60204. After the drive has come to a, a stop, energy supply to the drive is then removed. And then you've got safe stop two. Uh, this is where the PSC-1 can monitor the motor braking or the controlled stop according to EN 60204. Once the motor is at a standstill, the drive is stopped without the disconnection of power. So it's a safe operating stop. By actively holding the position without the removal of power, there's no loss of precision because the synchronization between the axes and the process is no longer lost. So that's really a, a very powerful feature uh, when you're integrating motion uh, functions with your, with your safety system. Uh, now I'm going to kind of go through some of these functions that we've integrated our control into our controller so you guys have an understanding of what they are and how they can be utilized. And the first ones I want to talk about is the safe limited speed and safe speed range. Uh, this function is, is often utilized during machine setup or jog functions. So in the event of an error, the safe limited speed uh, function will provide the fastest possible reaction time to protect the operator from any hazard. Uh, the fast shutoff um, outputs of our system can also be utilized to, to achieve an even shorter response time for, for the system. A lot of the standards out there are broken up into type A, type B, and type C, which are machine-specific standards. And a lot of times they'll actually specify if you're doing setup, if you're doing a feeding or a jogging of the machine, there's a speed limit in the standard that, that can be, uh, cannot be uh, um, surpassed. So uh, the way you'd properly integrate that is by monitoring that the jog function isn't going too fast and therefore creating a hazard to the operator. Uh, the PSC-1 will monitor a predefined maximum speed. There's a comparison of the current speed with the parametrized speed threshold. If that threshold is exceeded, the system will react to protect the operator. Uh, you can do a max acceleration parameterization in there. You can do ramp monitoring uh, to monitor the transition from fast to slow. And you can do overspeed distance monitoring to enable filtering of peak speeds in case of a regular travel operation. The next uh, function block that we've integrated for safe motion is your safe limited position. Uh, this is the monitoring of permissible speed related to the relative distance to a parametrized teach-in target position. It's going to ensure that the motor does not exceed the preset position. If a monitored value is violated, the motor is braked using a safe stop to ensure the operator's safety and or prevent damage to the machine. So there's a calculation of the actual speed and the actual position signal. There's a determination of the stop distance related to the current status of acceleration and speed and directions considered, whether you're going clockwise or counterclockwise. 
Uh, one of the things that I, I see more and more nowadays is a collaborative robot on a slide going back and forth between two functions. That's something you, you probably want to monitor that slide and that speed to make sure that over time that robot's not going to crash into the end of the slide, either damaging the robot or putting an operator in, into a dangerous uh, scenario. So this is uh, another motion monitoring that can be integrated into the, the PSC-1 safety controller. Another function is the safe limited increment, so a step. Uh, the motor is allowed to travel a permitted distance or step following a start command. Uh, a safe stop function is triggered once the limit value is reached. If the permitted distance is exceeded, uh, it, it has to be detected and the motor must be brought to a standstill requiring a reset. Um, that's basically what this function is going to be monitoring. So if you're doing a step and all of a sudden it steps further than, than is permissible, uh, something's off in the system, you want to make sure everything's safe and um, you have to address the issue before resetting uh, to make sure, again, you're not damaging equipment, putting anyone in danger or, or damaging the parts themselves. Um, typically, we'll see this with roller feeds, if you're feeding material through rollers and you're stepping it through uh, through the process. The next function is gonna be your safe emergency limit. Uh, this is when the monitoring of the permissible speed related to the relative distance to the maximum limit of movement or, or adjustment range. Um, this can really prevent over travel to protect operators from harm and equipment from damage. Uh, it's recording the process data for speed and acceleration over the position of the course of time. It's determining the stopping distance related to the current status of uh, uh, acceleration and speed, and a comparison of the current position and the and the stopping distance is done. So, if you're setting a robot or 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 um, a position up between between two areas, and you don't want the robot crashing through maybe the fencing. This could be something you could be used to monitor that. Um, a lot of times by doing these safe emergency limits, you can reduce the footprint of your machine. You can save floor space and reduce the, uh, the amount of space required for the guarding around a piece of equipment. So it's, uh, it, it, there's some good cost savings uh, to be realized there. Safe direction indication. This is going to prevent the motor from moving in an invalid direction. If the direction is violated, the safety system can react in time to protect the operator from the hazard. So we're monitoring a predefined sense of rotation or direction of movement. Um, the violation of the permissible monitoring range is saved and requires a reset. So if I'm supposed to be going left and all of a sudden I start to travel right, we can stop the machine, you can reset it before you are able to continue movement. Uh, a lot of times this application is going to remove the risk to an operator that is entering a work area to load or unload parts uh, while activity is being done in another zone. The safe cam function block, uh, this is when a safety output signal is going to indicate whether the motor is positioned inside a specific range these ranges are absolute position windows within a motor rotation. Uh, the monitoring of a parametrizable position range with the allocated minimum and maximum limits. Additional monitoring of the maximum rotational speed or the speed in the permissible range. And a typical application for this might be to limit motion and prevent damage to the machine uh, that could be caused by movement out of the parametrized uh, limits. So with our safe drive monitoring integration into the PSC-1, there's a lot of encoder signals that are supported. We can do incremental encoders where you've got your position and speed uh, detected via pulses and distance. We can do sine and cosine encoders with the position and speed are detected via sine and cosine and distance. Uh, SSI, absolute encoders, um, proximity switch counters, either one or two proximity switches and, and a pulse count. Um, depending on the functionality that you are trying to achieve uh, from a monitoring uh, may determine what the appropriate uh, encoder signal would be uh, that you'd want to bring back. And, and our experts here at Schmerzel uh, can assist you with these, these types of applications to make sure the, uh, the correct hardware is integrated. 
So that sort of concludes the safe drive monitoring capabilities of the PSC-1. Um, I think you may have realized now that it is really meeting what is uh, is called out in the standard um, uh, and what has been developed in the drives. Uh, it gives the, the users and the machine builders and system integrators a safe way to actually integrate these newer technologies uh, into a safety system properly and meet required performance levels uh, for, for the safety monitoring. Uh, the next thing I'm gonna highlight with our safety controller is gonna be our software features, uh, the different things that really make our software a pleasure to work with. And I'm gonna start again with the field bus. Um, when you open up our hardware, uh, you can select the field bus. Again, Ethernet IP, Profinet, and Ether, EtherCAT are the, the three main ones that we, we see in most of our applications. Uh, you can just activate this field bus in the software. Um, you just select which field bus you want to activate. Then you can interface with your hardware device, and there's a few different ways you can do that. Uh, we mentioned that you can load that on the SD card. You can, of course, use our programming cable, but you can also interface via the Ethernet connection. Um, so you do have some options there. You want to send that network configuration to the hardware and utilize the IP administrator tool um, to select your network card. You can scan the network and um, for all active devices uh, with activated DHCP, but without assigned IP addresses, or you can enter your desired IP address and deactivate DHCP to permanently assign the IP address. So again, you have a few options here for interface with the hardware device. Uh, via the connection settings. Um, you can choose to connect via the programming cable or via the Ethernet port. Uh, you, your network settings can be sent to the hardware via the field bus connection or over the programming cable. Uh, so if you, if you don't have the programming cable, you can still send uh, over the Ethernet your network configuration and then you can program over the Ethernet cable. That's, that's not an issue. The next software feature that I want to talk about is our intuitive graphical user interface for logic program. Um, we do a lot of predefined input and output put blocks right off the bat. Uh, so you're dropping in an emergency stop, you're dropping in a light curtain, an interlock, a start button, a reset button, maybe a, a semiconductor or relay output. Um, these predefined input and output blocks reduce the programming time and eliminate the function blocks from the program. So you no longer need to connect inputs to a function block to tell the software what type of input or output device you've connected. Uh, we use standard Boolean type logic blocks and or not flip-flops, edge detection, timers, exclusives. Uh, your timers, those can be pulses, uh, those can be on delays, off delays, intermittent timers. You can create custom or group logic blocks. So if you want to create a custom or group of logic blocks that you're going to use in multiple pieces of equipment, you can create that and save it to your library. Um, you can also share that with other uh, engineers on at your facility so they can utilize that uh, in their machine designs. You can use terminal ins or terminal outs, uh, which are also referred to as jump labels. Uh, so this way, if you're using multiple pages of logic programming, maybe you've got different functions or different zones on different pages, you can use a jump label to jump your e-stop into each one of those pages and connect it to a device. Um, you can expand, as, as that kind of alludes to, you can expand your logic program over multiple pages. So there's really no limit to how much you can do with this, with this software. Uh, the software also utilizes Microsoft keyboard shortcuts, so cut, copy, paste, undo, et cetera. Those hotkeys uh, are available. So if you want to cut some logic by holding Control C and then uh, go and paste it somewhere else, you can do that. Um, you can, uh, you know, do some programming. If you decide, oh, I, I messed up, I want to go back to where I was 10 minutes ago, you can do the hotkeys to undo what you've done step by step until you get back to the point uh, that you want it to be in. You can add text blocks and titles that, that you can add to your logic program. So in the picture to the right here, there's a text box that says this is safety function number one, zone one resets required if a guard door is open, the light curtain is interrupted or an e-stop is pressed. 
And then at the bottom there, you can see the title slide, which can be, you know, for, for a mine, I've got the Schmerzel Safe Solutions for Your Industry title slide. Uh, but you can have your own company's logo and information, the customer's um, machine name on those title slides. So later when you print your report and you um, uh, have your logic circuit uh, in your report, it'll have the correct information or the, uh, the information for your company on those logic slides as well. Uh, another feature of the software that, that is really, really nice is our diagnostics tool. This allows you to see the logic and wiring mistakes live. If you're commissioning a machine or you're trying to trouble machine, troubleshoot a machine in the field, you can connect to that machine and hit the diagnostics button, or you can view the machine live and see what's happening. The yellow cables are highlighted because they're hot. I've got 24 volts or sorry, in this case, test pulse zero and test pulse one coming through my uh, door control and my e-stop, and I see that on my PSC one, but my reset's not hit. So while I've got the test pulse zero going into my reset, that line's red, I don't have it coming into the PSC one. When you're commissioning a machine in the field and you've got a deadline to get that machine up and running, uh, you don't wanna spend a day chasing down a wiring mistake quickly, you know, firing this up and looking at the diagnostics tool is one way that you can see if you have a wiring mistake. Of course, you can also look at all the LED indicators uh, on the PSC1 and in the, in the system for any of those issues as well. Uh, but if you want to remote connect to a machine in the field, this is another way you can see what's happening both in the wiring and the logic. You can sit there while they're running the machine and watch these turning on and off as they open and close doors and look for wiring mistakes that way as well. So it's an easy way to also complete your, your machine validation uh, and verification tasks. The next software feature is gonna be a simulation tool. This is really something that's gonna save you some time uh, in the design phase uh, for your logic design. It lets you test the logic before you have any hardware. So you can verify that the software works as it's intended to work before you upload it into a piece of hardware and start wiring up a machine. You can identify and correct any logic mistakes prior to installation, further reducing your design time and cost. Uh, sometimes you might have missed a not block, maybe you needed an or block instead of an and block. This is somewhere you can use that simulator tool uh, to simulate the software and find those issues um, before, before hardware installation. Some additional software tools that are worth noting uh, we do have customizable usernames and user rights. Um, this allows for different levels of access to the software uh, to protect the logic program. Maybe the machine builder or system integrator uh, are providing themselves with full access, uh, but they've created additional users for on-site engineers or maintenance per personnel. And those users are given a different set of rights. Maybe they can view the software and error codes, but they're not allowed to change the logic. Um, and affect the, the actual safety functions. Uh, CRC, device configuration, uh, parameter data, and programming are all done. Uh, what that means is that when you commission a piece of software and load it into a piece of hardware, when you run your report, you can record the CRC number, um, which is basically saying that this is the system we engineered and sold. Uh, if there's a problem five, 10, 20 years down the road, you can run that report off the hardware in the field and look at the CRC data to see if it's changed. Uh, if it has changed, then someone has gone in and made a, um, a change to the logic, and that may be where you wanna start uh, looking for what's causing the current problems today on a machine that's been working fine, fine for years. Uh, it's also a great way for machine builders and integrators to protect themselves. Uh, if something is changed, um, and they're drug into a court. This is a way to point that the system that's currently being used is not the same system that they uh, uh, developed or, or sold. Uh, there's language options, English, German, Spanish, Japanese, Portuguese, Chinese. Uh, so the machine designer or programmer can program in their preferred language. Um, they can run a report again in that preferred language, and then they can switch the language. So if I wanna program in English, I want to print the report in English, but the machine's shipping maybe to Mexico. 
I can also run a report in Spanish. I can switch the language to Spanish and ship the machine in Spanish. Uh, so now the customer support report can be both uh, English and Spanish. So it's by it can have uh, two reports and there's the, the bilingual capabilities. Um, that report is customizable. So you can select the report to include the global network, which is your master to master communication network, your device to device. You can do the local network, which is the individual um, piece of hardware and, and what's connected to that. You can do your terminal scheme or your wiring schematic. Um, you can do your functional log logic scheme, so you can print all the logic pages that you have and include those. Uh, you can decide whether you want your group logic button uh, functionality to be viewed or not viewed in that system. Uh, maybe you considering the logic that you have used in a certain group to be proprietary, and you don't want the customers to be able to view that so that uh, if they <coughs> need to integrate further equipment down the road, they need to come back to you and, and have you um, provide that uh, that expertise again. You can also print the uh, the serial diagnostics 4.0 bus groups, uh, and you can do the project and customer information uh, or title sheets and things of that nature. From a diagnostic standpoint, uh, there's lots of ways to see the diagnostics on this system. You've got your hardware, your software, your field bus, and the sensors. Uh, the hardware has the LED indicators for every input and output on the PSC1. The LED indicators are also on the field bus communication and serial diagnostics 4.0 safety bus. You have your alphanumerical display on the hardware for status alarm and error enunciation. You have LED indication on all of the Schmerzel electronic safety sensors and interlocks. Your software has those diagnostics tools as well as the error and alarm information if you want to remote connect in and view those. Your field bus can communicate the data bits to the PLC if you want to pull it up on an HMI uh, or remote connect in and see what's happening. Um, long story short, there's any way you want to get the diagnostics that, that has been thought of, uh, we basically have that integrated into our system solutions for you. Uh, finally, we're going to talk about how does this really increase the production or reduce the cost of a system. Uh, the first way to reduce cost is the cost, space, installation, labor, and machine downtime. A big part of that's going to be the serial diagnostics 4.0 safety bus. You're reducing the in-panel component cost by reducing terminal blocks, the landing of wires, the amount of I.O. on the safety PLC or the process PLC, which reduces your labor costs for installation. You're increasing the diagnostics information, which is greatly going to reduce the unscheduled downtime of the equipment and, and increase your uptime. Uh, the two amp output powers can reduce additional in-panel components, uh, such as interposing relays that you may have needed in the past to bump up output power. Uh, your diagnost diagnostics is going to really assist with your troubleshooting capabilities, again, to reduce the unscheduled downtime of equipment and increase your uptime. And then your safe drive monitoring integration is going to increase the machine operating efficiencies, improve ergonomics for plant operators, and save space due to the resulting reduction in safe distances to the danger points. Uh, so that all of these combined are ways that you're going to be able to realize cost reduction and a more sophisticated um, system solution on a modern uh, piece of equipment. Some additional resources uh, that we have available. There is a PSC1 hardware configurator. Uh, if you want to go online at www.psc1.de, you can drop in the field buses that you want to use, the input and output devices you, you need for a system, um, the access monitoring that you might need. Uh, you can add the actuators and you can get a build of materials. Uh, we can also work with you with your regional managers or technical support team here at Schmerzel uh, to optimize that safety solution. We do have a number of safety input and safety output electromechanical relays uh, that may be more cost effective with certain features to integrate, um, you know, to expand your outputs for a, a batch of um, uh, motors that might all need shut off together uh, for a certain zone. That might be a way to, to save some costs. Um, your field bus description files, EtherCAT, Ethernet IP, Profinet, Profibus, those are all available. We can send those to you or they can be downloaded from our website. Again, we have that system diagnostic system engineering tool that I showed earlier. There's YouTube videos uh, that cover a lot of the safe drive monitoring functionality. 
uh, directly on Schmerzel's YouTube channel. So if you want to see some animations and descriptions of those a little further, you can do that. And then we have our TUV certified technical support team, as well as our product specialists uh, for this product that can support you in the development of a safety solution for your next machine, project, or line. Uh, finally, we've got our Tech NICOM Engineering Services Department. Um, this is a, a, a portion of Schmerzel that can assist with engineering practices. We can do machine risk assessments for your equipment. There's my timer. Uh, we can do your software program, your system integration, schematic creation, machine validation reports, system of file assistance, training services. Uh, we can even program your safety controller for you uh, through engineering hours. So that is uh, another uh, area where you can get some, some assistance. Uh, I realize I'm at the end of my hour here, but um, David, if we can open up the Q&A shortly, uh, try yeah. to answer here. Yeah, unfortunately, we're, we are running short on time. We've, we've hit our hour limit, but um, I do. So if you do have uh, any questions, please enter them into the question box now. I, I guarantee we will not get to all of them, but um, we, we can follow up uh, offline. I'm, I'm sure Nick will spend some time later today and or tomorrow. Uh, getting back to some questions we didn't answer um very quickly in regards to the software is there is there a cost on the psc1 software so there there is a cost um for the software sort well it's a yes and no question the software can be downloaded full version of the software for free you can play with the programming you can do the simulation and everything like that uh, but there is a, a small cost for a license fee, and that's just a way that we recuperate our development cost. Um, it is a one-time cost, so it's really designed so that machine builders are paying very little for it. You don't have to buy it for every machine uh, that needs to be produced. The, the um, thought process there was by separating that out instead of building it into the component cost. Uh, a user that's going to buy 10 pieces of equipment uh, is only paying for that once, not 10 times. Uh, that being said, strictly speaking, Schmerzel is not a software company, so we're not trying to make a profit on that. If you've got a system, um, we can work with you on pricing for the software to uh, make that fairly low. Uh, but when you compare the software cost to other um, options on the market today, it, it is fairly a low-cost solution. Okay, uh, one last question very quick. Um, obviously, there's uh, some raw material shortages and long lead times, um, on especially on higher end uh, components, so microchips and that kind of stuff. Does that any affect any of our PSC1 product and what are the lead times? So right now, the PSC1 products are not being affected by the microprocessor shortages on the market. Um, we are having some delays with our programming cables, but as I mentioned before, uh, strictly speaking, you can use the Ethernet uh, to transfer files and communicate. So if you've got uh, a field bus cable, you wouldn't need that programming cable. The main portion of this presentation that we are having an effect with our supply issues right now in regards to the semiconductors and microprocessors is going to be the electronic switches that we utilize on a serial diagnostics 4.0 safety bus. Uh, when you're looking at that total integrated solution, uh, some of those switches are you know, being pushed out to about 16 week uh, lead time. Um, so really, if we're looking at a solution um, we want to work with you to get those on order quickly. But the, the safety controller itself, uh, there's no real um, lead time issues with that right now. I believe if you placed an order for one today, you, you would have it delivered within two weeks. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Nick, for your time. We, uh, we are running a little bit over. Uh, so thanks, Nick. Uh, thank you all for attending. And, and uh, any further questions come up please submit them to us just send an email to um, your local regional manager uh, to david or myself and and we will answer those questions to you directly yep uh yeah if you have any further questions nick is available at uh, nick styler at schmerzel.com or you can go to our website uh, schmerzelusa.com find some more information uh this 
webinar was recorded, so we will be sending that information out. And like I said, if you had questions that we didn't answer, we will be following up. And uh, as there are some documents in the handouts and some links to YouTube videos. So if you do want some more information, just let us know. And uh, so once again, thank you for your time and have a great day. Thank you, everyone.